8. The Image of God and Faceless Man The doctrine of the image of God in man has more than an academic relationship to the central problems of philosophy and theology. Moreover, it has a practical relevancy. Man today is unable to define himself because he has no standard in terms of which he can define anything. Man today is unable to know himself because he also lacks a standard whereby he can know anything. No amount of miscellaneous data is able to overcome this shortcoming. Man's knowledge today is Alexandrian, masses of detail without a focus. And according to Christian faith to know himself, man must know God because it is in God's image that he is created. Moreover, as Van Til states it, quote, to not know God, man would have to destroy himself. He cannot do this. There is no non-being into which man can slip in order to escape God's face and voice. The mountains will not cover him. Hades will not hide him. Nothing can prevent his being confronted, quote, with him with whom we have to do, end quote. Whenever he sees himself, he sees himself confronted with God, end quote. The concept of the image of God has received renewed attention from neo-orthodoxy, but only to its confusion. Lacking the creator-creature distinction and a true principle of discontinuity because it fails to believe in creation, neo-orthodoxy confuses the image with correspondence to or participation in being. The result is a confusion of finitude with sin, Man has confused finitude with sin because he is in sin. Having made himself good in his own eyes, man sees his shortcoming not as an ethical one, but as a metaphysical one. Mutability and finitude trouble him and are sin in his eyes because he is set on being God, determining good and evil for himself and establishing his reason as arbiter over all things. Man cannot see sin as Scripture sees it unless he believes in the God of Scripture. What then is the image of God and what is its theological importance? The scholastic view of the image was that it is a donum superadditum. The sense world was viewed in semi-pagan terms as pre-existing and more or less evil or undesirable. The material was sharply distinguished from the spiritual, the latter being the domain of religion. One left the world and renounced material things to serve God. Because of this division of matter and spirit, and because the spirit had a special affinity to God in this thinking, the body was regarded as divisive, and the spirit, carrying the image, unitive with God. Protestantism has not been free from this same strain, as witness Robert Hall's comments on his sermon on, quote, the spirituality of the divine nature, end quote, quote, the body has a tendency to separate us from God by the dissimilarity of its nature. The soul, on the contrary, unites us again to him by means of those principles and faculties which, though infinitely inferior, are of a character congenial to his own. The body is the production of God. The soul is his image. End quote. Similarly, Chalmers declared, quote, The mind of man is a creation and therefore indicates by its characteristics the character of him to the fiat and the forthcoming of whose will it owes its existence. End quote. Schaeffer, who cites these statements, declares also, quote, It is not asserted that man's corporal nature is involved in this comparison, since it is predicated of God that he is spirit. John 4.24 But if the body and matter are also the creation of God, will they not equally reveal their maker? And if the soul has so substantial an affinity to God by mere virtue of being spirit, then why is it that Scripture regards the most heinous sins, contemporary opinion in the pew to the contrary, to be sins of the spirit? And why are the, quote, most spiritual, end quote, people consistently the greatest plague to the church? Implicit in these opinions is the leaven of paganism, a dualism between matter and spirit, and a belief that matter is, if not evil, at the very least lower. Implicit also is a metaphysical rather than ethical approach to the question of the image. Since God is spirit, 
then his image can only be that which is also spirit. Since God is not matter, his image cannot be imparted to matter, which is regarded at best as a mere production of God, and hence alien to him in a sense which spirit cannot be. Luther failed to break fully with the scholastic conception of man and viewed the image of God exclusively in terms of the moral attributes of knowledge, righteousness and holiness, to which subsequent generations added dominion with respect to the male. Calvin, on the other hand, thought of the image in the wider sense as consisting of man's intellect and will. Although Calvin saw the centrality of righteousness and true holiness to any concept of God, he remarked that, quote, the whole of God's image, end quote, the image extended to every aspect of man's being, his body and soul, so that Calvin's comment concerning man's image and dominion, quote, thus man was rich before he was born, end quote, is especially appropriate. Quote, Therefore, by this word, the perfection of our whole nature is designated as it appeared when Adam was endued with a right judgment, had affections in harmony with reason, had all his senses sound and well regulated, and truly excelled in everything good. Thus, the chief seat of the divine image was in his mind and heart, where it was eminent, yet was there no part of him in which some scintillations of it did not shine forth. End quote. To include the whole of man's personality in the image of God was a step with tremendous implications concerning the nature of man, his relationship to the world, and his relationship to God. As Van Til has observed, in commenting on the pagan leaven in the scholastic doctrine, quote, Man was in part formed out of this pre-existing sense world. Accordingly, the whole of man's relationship as a self-conscious being was not with the personality of God. In other words, Man's relationship to the world about him was not completely mediated through the personality of God. There was a remnant of impersonalism about it all. End quote. For a man to be created in God's image means that he is like God in every respect in which a creature can be like God. It means, in the wider sense, that man, like God, is a personality. But man is always different from God, although created in his image in that he is a creature and cannot partake of the incommunicable attributes of God, his aseity, immutability, infinity and unity. Because man was created in the image of God, he has an organic relationship to the universe God created. As Van Til states, quote, That is, man was to be prophet, priest and king under God in this created world. The vicissitudes of the world would depend upon the deeds of man. As a prophet, man was to interpret this world. As a priest, he was to dedicate this world to God, and as a king, he was to rule over it for God. In opposition to this, all non-Christian theories hold that the vicissitudes of man and the universe about him are only accidentally and incidentally related to one another. End quote. Man, because he was created in the image of God, was created with the law of God in his being. For man to live in terms of his own nature means to live in terms of God's law. Since every fibre of his being was God created and revealed moreover the impress of God's image, and since every fact in creation was God created and God interpreted, man could not and cannot help both to know God and to reveal him in and through himself. The fall of man, however, was man's rebellion against this reality and, quote, his attempt to do without God in every respect. End quote. Man now attempts to deny the witness of God in his own being and in all creation and to interpret the universe without reference to God. Quote, the result for man was that he made for himself a false ideal of knowledge. Man made for himself the ideal of absolute comprehension and knowledge. This he could never have done if he had continued to recognize that he was a creature. It is totally inconsistent with the idea of creatureliness that man should strive for comprehensive knowledge. If it could be obtained, it would wipe God out of existence. Man would then be God. And because man sought for this unattainable ideal, 
he brought upon himself no end of woe. In conjunction with man's false ideal of knowledge, we may mention here the fact that when man saw he could not attain his own false ideal of knowledge, he blamed this on his finite character. Man confused finitude with sin. Thus he commingled the metaphysical and the ethical aspects of reality. Not willing to take the blame for sin, man laid it to circumstances round about him or within him. End quote. Bart, Brunner and Niebuhr are ready to say that man is finite and evil, but being unwilling to grant that he is truly created or that he is sinful in the sense described above, they cannot give a biblical concept of man. Man is for them his own ultimate point of reference because, despite their attempts to overcome their inheritance, they still hold basically to the thinking of fallen man that finitude is sin and the heart of man's predicament. But man, despite these subterfuges, cannot escape knowing God. Nature reveals God to man and also reveals man to himself, having been created for man as man was created for God. Both nature and man are sustained by God and under the influence of his non-saving or common grace. Moreover, man reveals himself to himself and reveals God to himself. Since, as Calvin declared in the opening lines of the Institutes, quote, Our very being is nothing else than subsistence in God alone, end quote. It is impossible for man's nature to fail to reveal its maker and sustainer. If the heavens declare God's glory and the firmament reveals his handiwork, how much more man made a little lower than God, Psalm 8, Revised Version. As Van Til has observed, commenting on Romans 119, quote, Man is and remains God's self-conscious creature. It was in the activity of the mind of man that God's revelation in the created universe originally found its highest climax. This is still the case. The created personality is the highest manifestation of the personality of God. Hence, in the very activity of his own personality, man is placed before the clearest manifestation of the truth with respect to himself, apart from redemptive revelation. End quote. If all facts are created facts, then no facts are neutral in their witness to the Creator, least of all man, not only a creature, but formed in the image of God. To presuppose a neutrality of data and to presuppose a neutrality of witness on man's part is to deny that God created all things and to deny that man is created in his image? The basic question is this. Is man faceless? Is he no more than a blank? If he is faceless and a blank, then neutrality is possible. But if man is truly created in God's image, then neutrality is an impossibility and the pretense to it no more than disguised hostility. To hold that neutrality is possible is to eliminate God as creator and relegate him, at best, to a position of another fact among many miscellaneous and meaningless facts, a fact, moreover, which, like some strange species of life, remains unknown until discovered. This, in fact, is precisely what Clark does with God. Quote, For an illustration, suppose that the discoverer of an uninhabited island in some remote ocean should search it to determine whether a particular form of animal life ever existed in that place. It is quite possible for him to search carefully and, discovering no evidence, still remain in ignorance. He could not be sure, however, that the particular animal had never lived on the island because, even though the search had been diligent, still tomorrow the remains might be discovered. Similarly, Aside from the question whether much or little evidence is needed to lead one to a belief in God, it is clear that no finite amount of searching could rationally lead one to deny the existence of God. During the time of the atheist's investigation of this earth, it just might be that God was hiding on the other side of the moon, and if some rocket should take the atheist to the moon, there is no reason to hold that God might not go over to Jupiter for the express purpose of inconveniencing the atheist. End quote. If God is so elusive a fact, then indeed he is a seriously limited and irrelevant God. 
If such neutrality of investigation and neutrality of data exists, then the doctrine of creation and the doctrine of the image of God are sheer nonsense, lovely tales, no doubt, but practically meaningless. Van Til has aptly observed of Clark's statements, quote, But a god who can thus escape to the moon or to Jupiter is not inconveniencing the atheist at all. On the contrary, he shows himself to be so finite, so insignificant, that the atheist can cover the whole earth without being confronted by him. This is the exact reverse of the teaching of Calvin, based on Paul, that God is divinity and power, being always and everywhere so obviously present that he who says there is no God is a fool. The foolishness of the denial of the Creator lies precisely in the fact that this Creator confronts man in every fact, so that no fact has any meaning for man except it be seen as God's creation. End quote. Man meets the revelation of God at every turn, and in every fibre of his being. It's impossible for him to find a single fact, a single event, a single blade of grass, which does not bear witness to creation and demand a God-given interpretation. And man cannot meet a single fact nor live a single moment without confronting God. But whenever man is confronted by the revelation of God in and through all creation, he reacts to it. Neutrality is impossible. He reacts inevitably in terms of an attempt to be his own God and interpreter, or else a godly acceptance of his role as God's image and his calling to be prophet, priest and king under God. But because the issues of history are not yet settled and because epistemological self-consciousness has not yet fully come upon the tares and the wheat, the reaction is not so clear-cut, but is rather a mixed reaction and a mixed interpretation. In the godly, the effects of the fall often hamper his acceptance of his role and of his full subservience to the God-given interpretation. In the ungodly, created also in God's image, common grace, creation grace, in that it is a mark of their creation by God in his image, with his general favour and in original righteousness, the full effects of the fall are not yet manifest. Their epistemological self-consciousness is not yet complete, and their life and interpretation again is a mixed product. One cannot deal with common grace seriously or correctly apart from the doctrines of creation and the image of God. The fall, then, has vitiated man's nature. This taint is total in that it affects all of man's nature, but it is not absolute, nor will it be absolute until history ends. It is total in that the whole personality of man is fallen, as Van Til points out, we have no ground for assuming that the will is fallen and reason still sound, or on the other hand, that reason is fallen and intuitions remain sound. The whole personality of man is affected and his body, soul and mind weakened and perverted. Moreover, since God's image requires God's glory, man, in his fallen attempts to establish his own glory, finds the whole of his personality and every aspect of his being dogged by self-frustration. He is God's creation and God's instrument, and as he puts himself to misuse, he finds himself blunted, warped, and tortured by his own perversity. Because ungodly man is not yet a finished product, his frustration as well as his perversity is not yet absolute. When history ends in judgment and the new creation, the fullness of frustration will appear in the fullness of hell. Meanwhile, man tries every expediency and device to deny the witness of creation and his own being, and to find a refuge in any and everything, including, and especially, some kind of God and religion. As Van Til has observed, quote, Men cannot be brought to bay if they have any place to which they can go. End quote. On the other hand, godly man seeks to grow in his salvation, in the working out of the meaning of the image of God in every walk of life. He seeks to interpret the world and to subdue it in every avenue of life, in science, agriculture, industry and education. He seeks to rule under God and as priest to dedicate all of creation and all of his activity to God. He seeks to grow in righteousness, that is, to become a whole person, 
to maintain within his being the proper coordination and subordination of each and every aspect of his nature, to subordinate himself to God and to coordinate himself with his fellow man. He recognizes increasingly that because creation is revelational, showing forth at all times the creative and sustaining will of God and offering facts interpretive of his will, he is at all times in contact with the expressed will of God. But full epistemological self-consciousness will not come until the end. Hence, as we have seen, the creation grace still manifests itself clearly in the unregenerate. The doctrine of common grace, like the doctrine of saving grace, is dependent upon sound conceptions of the self-contained God, creation, and the image of God. As Van Til points out, quote, To set the doctrine of common grace in the proper perspective, therefore, requires setting off Reformed theology as a whole from Romanist and also from Evangelical thinking. On a Romanist basis, even special grace is largely thought of along the lines of lifting man in the scale of being. On its basis, common grace would therefore be only gradationally different from special or saving grace. No other than gradational differences are possible once one holds to the human will as in some measure autonomous, and once one holds to the idea of man as participant in the same being with God. The idea of saving grace is then the offering to all men, or at least to groups of men, the real or ultimate possibility of salvation, along with the equally ultimate possibility of destruction. In no case can God overcome completely the tendency of finite beings to slip into non-being. End quote. Without a conception of God as autonomous and self-contained, without the doctrines of creation and the discontinuity between God and created being, man's conception of both saving and common grace becomes a matter of common participation in being or a doctrine of correspondence. It becomes necessary in the name of common grace to assert, against predestination, a doctrine of freedom for Adam which is not creaturely freedom, but the ultimate freedom of God. The doctrine of creation and the doctrine of the image of God in man make impossible this pagan notion of common grace, which is actually a doctrine of common being. Common grace, then, becomes metaphysical in character in that it preserves the finite man from slipping back into non-being. But, as Van Til observes, quote, Only by maintaining its exclusively ethical character can common grace be properly related to saving grace? End quote. The problem of common grace is an attempt to deal with the civil righteousness of the unregenerate, in other words, with the question of ethics. To answer it by revising one's metaphysics is hardly a Christian answer. The doctrine of creation and creation grace, of the divine decree and the unfinished nature of history, provide the answer an ethical answer within the framework of Christian metaphysics. In Common Grace, Van Til points out emphatically that all men have all things in common, psychologically and metaphysically. But epistemologically, the natural man has nothing in common with the Christian. He asserts his own ultimacy and tries to rethink all things in terms of this concept. But God does not leave natural man wholly to himself, he strives with man, restrains the wrath of man, acts with forbearance, and sends his rain and sunshine upon the just and unjust alike. This epistemological difference between the Christian and the natural man is not with regard to the laws of thought, but with regard to the ethical presuppositions underlying thought. Natural man is at war with himself. Created by God and in his image, his being testifies against him as he tries to assert his own ultimacy and autonomy. He is surrounded by the restraining power of God's common grace. His own awareness of the full and open implications of his claims is not yet fully mature or self-conscious. As a result, there is no consistency in his working principles. He has some ideas derived from the image of God and some derived from his idea of autonomy. Quote, 
It is thus in the mixed situation that results because of the factors mentioned. 1. That every man knows God naturally. 2. That every sinner is in principle anxiously striving to efface that knowledge of God. And 3. That every sinner is in this world still the object of the striving of the Spirit calling him back to God. That cooperation between believers and unbelievers is possible. Both sides can, by virtue of the gifts of God that they enjoy, contribute to science. The question of ethical hostility does not enter in at this point. Not merely weighing and measuring, but the argument for the existence of God and for the truth of Christianity can as readily be observed to be true by non-Christians as by Christians. Satan knows all too well that God exists and that Christ was victor over him on Calvary, but the actual situation in history involves the other factors mentioned. Thus, there is nowhere an area where the second factor, that of man's ethical hostility to God, does not also come into the picture. This factor is not as clearly in evidence when men deal with external things. It is more clearly in evidence when they deal with the directly religious question of the truth of Christianity. But it is nonetheless present everywhere. It is present in the field of weighing and measuring, in the field of externals as well as in the field of more directly religious import. It is present here in that the natural man attempts to impose his false philosophy of fact upon the things that he weighs and measures. This is not theoretically the case, so long as he uses these factors for non-scientific purposes. It is even then practically the case. Even then he does not seek to obey Paul's injunction to men to the effect that whether they eat or drink they should do all things to the glory of God. But it is theoretically the case when they seek to work scientifically. In that case, non-believers use a non-rationalistic principle of individuation. They assume that the facts they weigh and measure are not created and controlled by God. They assume this with respect to every fact. Thus, they assume that God does not speak to them through these facts. On the other hand, they assume that the powers of logic given to them by their Creator are not so given them. They virtually assume that by these powers they can determine what is possible and what is impossible. End quote. The natural man's conception of fact is that factuality is independent of God and that he himself is also, at the very least, independent. For him, any kind of fact can exist rather than only God-given facts. Moreover, these facts receive their interpretation from man rather than from God. Quote, Every fact, then, that has scientific standing is such only if it does not reveal God, but does reveal man as ultimate. End quote. Thus, the natural man operates on two principles. First, the existence of brute factuality, and second, on the basis that he is the ultimate interpreter. A third principle prevents the full operation of the first two. Common grace prevents him from being fully consistent. He finds himself respecting the honest, noble and true, and often makes a better neighbour, as Calvin and Van Til after him have pointed out, than the Christian. Their metaphysical constitution remains unchanged. Their ethical rebellion is restrained by common grace. On his own principles, the natural man could have no science. He would have nothing but the miscellaneous and unrelated mass of data gleaned from brute factuality. The doctrine of creation gives meaning and interpretation to all things and makes the unity of science possible. But since creation and the fall there has been a development in two directions, towards the fulfilment of man's rebellion in full and self-conscious evil and towards the fulfilment of man's calling in good. The two tendencies are destined to grow more self-conscious and more consistent in every respect. It is in this sense that common grace is earlier grace, earlier in terms of the ultimate outcome. In the end, men will either be fully restored in the image of God or fully confirmed as covenant breakers, as men declaring themselves to be ultimate rather than God. The fall and the restoration will each be completed in their respective implications. The matter, then, is clear-cut. Despite the modern outlook, man is not faceless. 
He is not a blank moving out of non-being into being. He is a creature. More than that, a creature created in the image of God. This image is his face, his whole personality. Ungodly man, striving to put on the mask of deity, denies God in the process and ends up in total frustration as earlier grace gives way to full epistemological self-consciousness. At present, we have a still more or less, quote, undifferentiated stage of development, end quote, quote, but when all the reprobates are epistemologically self-conscious, the crack of doom has come, end quote. The fall will have become absolute and the restoration complete 